So there was a question that was raised on uh, OPEC's yes. capacity and the OPEC decision today about not increasing their quota amount. What's your take on that? So even though there wasn't an OPEC agreement today, I'm pretty confident that Saudi Arabia and a few others will do what's necessary to keep prices stable. Okay, so fast forward six months. So yes. you made a comment about uh, the OCS and Keystone and other production yes. uh, potential that needs to come out there. There's one school of thought that says in the second half of the year, if the U.S. and EU economies stay okay without going into a double dip and then China keeps growing, that we're actually going to see tightness in the third quarter. There's another school that says if we actually are going into the to the dip of a new recession, in part driven by higher prices, that the demand won't be there. How do you try to bring the, the supply chain in, back into balance, um, given the fact that we only have limited spare capacity out there? Right. Um, well, in the next six months, a lot of uh, the call on oil will be determined by uh, economic uh, and growth. growth. And it seems to be spotty. Uh, not as robust as we would like. You see that in the job numbers. You see that in 9.1% unemployment in our country. Europe has its problems because of the financial crisis there. Uh, inflationary problems in some of the emerging markets, starting with China, I think. I think the growth expectations are maybe a little lower than people thought three right. to six right. months ago. Having said that, they're still strong enough that the call on oil, I think, will go up. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I don't think with three million barrels a day or so of surplus capacity, there's any issue. Um, I, I think as you go forward, if the world grows a million barrels a day each year, which is a conservative number, right. and one could argue maybe it's a million five to a million eight, a lot of it driven right. by the emerging markets led by China and even the Middle East, I think we do have supply problems further out, like five years. Um, very worried that we will not grow our production uh, capacity of oil quickly enough to meet uh, the challenge of 95 million barrels a day right. of demand. I talked about 89 before. So I think the next couple of years we're okay. Five, ten years out, I think we got a serious problem unless we start to act now on two things. One is demand, which is conservation. Right. Uh, increasing mileage standards uh, uh, should be a priority of the U.S. administration. Uh, going to hybrid uh, cars uh, should be sooner than later. Right. Um, and, and yet at the same time on the supply side, you know, we need to encourage more investment to occur here. We don't want to do anything to discourage more domestic supply because more domestic supply means less foreign imports, right. better balance of trade, better uh, uh, deficit reduction, and more employment. Natural gas. So yes. shale gas, you talked about it as a game changer. Yes. Uh, shale gas, um, it, it is a great uh, treasure for our country uh, in terms of energy security. And we have to treat it that way. Yes. We have to be responsible and prudent about it. Uh, we have to be judicious about how we increase demand, uh, but also how we increase supply. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's an asset there that we're lucky to have. Absolutely. Uh, shale gas production, as you know, about five years ago was maybe 5% of our U.S. gas production. Today it's 30%. Um, and it is a game changer. I think first for electric generation. Mm -hmm. If you want to build 1,000 megawatts of power, uh, gas costs about a billion dollars mm -hmm. and takes about a year and a half to build. If you want 1,000 megawatts from coal, it takes three years and $3 billion. And if you want it from nuclear, nuclear. <laughs> it's, you know, if you're lucky, six, but more likely $8 billion right. and probably closer to eight years to build. Right. So for just the economic reason, we should be moving more of our power to gas. Right. And, and, you know, hydraulic fracturing, I understand in the public eye, mm -hmm. is something that is a concern. We should respect that. But having said that, the public needs to be educated. Hydraulic right. fracturing goes back to 1949. Of the 40 plus thousand wells that we drill in the United States, uh, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent are hydraulically fractured. Um, hydraulic fracturing is just taking water, sand, and some propant or gel right. uh, and in injecting it at high pressures into shale reservoirs uh, to fracture them so hydrocarbons can escape. Usually natural gas, once in a while, natural gas liquids or oil. So I think the industry has to maybe be a little more proactive instead of reactive into terms of educating the public, but also maybe making sure best practices are used as we well. Because we have to get this right. If you we want it, if it's right. that important to the industry, That's just right. like the deep water. Yeah, I think there's room for improvement, as we mentioned Absolutely. in the conference, for the industry to step up, as they have in spill response in the offshore. Exactly. John, absolute pleasure. Thank My you so pleasure. much, Jim.